In the Flint Dibble Graham Hancock debate, Flint made the case for metallurgy being something that we know for a fact didn't happen until relatively recent times. I'll let Flint explain. And I'd say we could definitively prove there was no large-scale metallurgy in the Ice Age. If you look at ice cores in, in the Arctic, right, we can track metallurgy of the Roman period, of medieval periods, based on lead emissions that end up in these ice cores. And there are no emissions from metallurgy in, in the Ice Age. Well, that seems pretty cut and dry, but as we saw in the last video, it might not necessarily be so. So let's take a look under the hood and see exactly what we've got here. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Dunking. Out the gate, what Flint said is fundamentally accurate, as far as how they determine if metallurgy occurred in a time and place. They look for heavy metal in the ice cores mostly, but also in bogs, caves, or other places where potential contamination of the samples gathered is small. Humans have created an impact in the amount of heavy metals present in the environment ever since we first harnessed fire. Burning wood releases some of these trace elements, and these have been used to determine if people used fire in a site or if they have, did not, especially in caves where they build up. Mining and smelting also releases heavy metals, more of them, so the traces of lead, copper, cadmium, cerium, and other metals are used as indicators for this activity. Lead is the more universal and abundant of these, and it shows up in all the metallurgy chemical signatures, which has caused it to be used as the standard indicator, a baseline for metal working of that time and place. Notice I said time and place, and that's the first thing to mention here is the way that Flint words that in the debate makes it sound very definitive, like we take some ice cores from Greenland, we know the uh, whole entire globe's metallurgical history, game, set, match. And that's not really how it works. Um, the ice cores in Greenland won't tell you anything about the metallurgical activity in the Andes up until like more modern times when it becomes a hugely industrial scale. But you go back a thousand years, there is nothing in Greenland from the Andes. To find the history of metallurgy in the Andes, they took ice cores from the Illimani Glacier, which is in the Andes itself. They didn't even go to Antarctica or use the tons of ice housed at the National Snow and Ice Data Center to check Antarctic cores. They had ones from right next door, but convenience wasn't the only reason that they stuck to these cores. They were able to obtain a local signature of copper and lead in the natural dust of the environment by looking back further than they expected to find signs of humans working metal. In the paper itself, titled Ice Core Evidence in the Earliest Extensive Copper Metallurgy in the Andes 2700 Years Ago, they explain it like this. To discriminate between the natural and anthropogenic origins of copper, enrichment factors were calculated. Enrichment factors are ratios of trace element concentrations to a lithogenic element such as aluminum, cerium, iron, ionium, neodymium, and titanium, which are normalized to the same elemental ratios of a reference material such as the global upper continental crust or the regional background. So in order to determine the difference between the background levels and those caused by humans, they had to have a good reading of the entire region from before humans started messing with the stuff. And that makes sense, but it's very much regional is my point. It's not like you can just like grab a few ice cores and know what's going on around the entire world. That Illimani glacier that they pulled the ice from in the Andes, it's just as useless when you try to work out what's going on with ancient Rome as Greenland is for working out what happened in the Andes. It doesn't give you anything. So all these things have to be done on a very regional level, which makes it very obvious if they have not tested the ice cores near where Hancock's lost civilization was said to have been, they wouldn't be finding the things that they're looking for. So that's the first thing to mention here is that Flint's watertight argument has a kind of a big hole right there when it comes to place. But what about time? I mentioned time as well. What else about that? What else about that? Man, I'm good with the words. Well, anyone who looks into the scientific stuff regarding lost civilizations won't be surprised by the issue we see here. They simply don't test far enough back in time with enough detail to tell us about metallurgy in the time Hancock's lost civilization is said to have existed. For example, the paper on the Andes I mentioned earlier goes back 6,500 years, about halfway. A paper titled Environmental Impact of Roman Mining and its Correlation with the Archaeological Evidence, a European Perspective, that sets out to do just what the title says it is. Well, it goes back about 4,000 years. Basically, when looking for human influence via heavy metals, they look a while farther back to find that regional background, that baseline, and after that, they just use the time frames they're focused on to get tested. And this makes sense. These ice cores are expensive to obtain, hard to test, and the funding for any project is limited. 
So it's no fault of the scientists involved when they don't test ice cores going back 30,000 years when they're looking for signs of humans working metal. That would make the research many times more expensive, and since they assume there's nothing to find there in the way of metallurgy back then, it sounds like a waste of funding to them. And I don't disparage that one bit, I totally get it. But when Flint uses this to debunk Hancock's lost civilization, he's not really looking at all the angles here. I mean, yeah, we've got ice cores going back hundreds of thousands of years, but they test for general lead in the environment. They're not using those specific fingerprints and backgrounds and stuff like we've been talking about. So they can't say with any certainty, they don't tell the same story, okay? They just talk about lead in the environment. They don't talk about all the fingerprints of metallurgy. To make certain my assumption about this was correct, that the scientists involved don't test for lead very often in older ice cores, I asked Dr. Peter Neff, aka Icy Pete, and he helped me out as you can see. Now I have to say, he's one of the scientists with respect for the lab coat. You don't really see him acting the ass on the internet and compromising his image as an impartial researcher. So if I was you, I would go give him a follow. After I wrote this script, but before I recorded, Flint found the freaking thread where I talked to Dr. Peter Neff. Even though me and Flint both have each other blocked now on Twitter, he found the thread and he, and he posts this scorched earth crap where he wants to make sure that no scientist will give me any information whatsoever. I guess, you know, science educators nowadays are afraid of people that might use science in a way that undermines their bullshit on Joe Rogan. I don't really understand exactly what his reasoning is there to make sure that nobody talks to me except for... It does very much demonstrate he, he is a science educator second and a personality on the internet first. Much science, big influence. Now in my last video, I didn't explain it well enough, I guess, but I did show that rice has a strong possibility of having been domesticated, returned to the wild, and domesticated again. I was still accused of simply playing Atlantis of the Gaps, which normally is a fair criticism, but in that case, and in this case here, it is not. We do have evidence in the record of repeated rises and drops of lead in the ice cores from Antarctica. And these rises and falls, they directly correspond to changes in the climate. During periods, like now, when the glaciers are lower than normal, we see more lead in the record. In times when the glaciers are at their height, we see less lead in the record. This is as regular as clockwork, and of course the scientists have taken notice and they have an explanation. More dust kicked up when less water covers the earth makes for more metal in the ice cores, that's what they say. But it could very well be humans working metal, certainly not on the scale that we do now, but it would track. It gets warmer, we start messing around with things, including metallurgy that shows up as lead in the record. It gets colder, we throw rocks and sticks at each other for a few thousand years, not so much lead in the record. It gets warmer again. My point is, is that when Flint says, no, you cannot have it for certain, it's, there's no way there was metallurgy, it's like, man, I, I could easily look at this graph and be like, well, I mean... How do we not know that there, there was metallurgy or not? What we would need to do is to find all those little other trace elements, the fingerprints, the regional things that we talked about earlier. And that's pretty complicated, right? That normally would seem like the kind of thing would be like, well, sorry guys, don't know what to tell you here. But, but actually, I've got an answer for this one, surprisingly enough. Remember earlier when I mentioned all that ice in the archive at the National Snow and Ice Data Center? The answer is probably there. Well, more specifically at the National Science Foundation Ice Course Facility where over 17,000 meters of ice are stored from around the world. 17,000 meters is roughly 55,775 vinyl records for you other Americans. But my point is, is in that facility, the ice is available to be examined. <laughs> kind of. In a frozen room and with all kinds of other special precautions. In other words, it's not available to me or to you, but to guys like ICP, it most certainly is. So, now, obviously, like I said earlier, you know, a normal scientific bit of research, they're, they're not going to have the funding to just go doing all this kind of stuff. But if we financed somebody that, you know, was able to do it, kind of like, you know, like uh, David Koch or the Edgar Cayce Foundation did when it came to carbon dating the Great Pyramids, we, we could actually check and see if there are signs of metallurgy in the record. The ice core data is, it, it's, it's housed. All we have to do is go dig, dig into it and look at it. But again, I can't do it and you can't do it. So my point is, is, this is a way that doesn't require a trip to Antarctica for us to see if Dibble or Hancock is right. Are those jumps in the lead in the record between glacial periods from human activity or not? See, this could give us some actual answers. Do we have chemical signatures of smelting, mining, or the like in these prehistoric times? Or is it just dust? Or does human history follow the pattern many believe it does? A serpent eating its own tail, a never-ending cycle of cataclysm and rebirth. As I said in my last video, the answers could be on a shelf somewhere and we wouldn't know it. Well, in this video, I can tell you where that shelf would be.
You know, science is a beautiful thing. I wouldn't have to worry about getting too wordy in these videos if I didn't love science as much as I do. I easy for me to talk with too much jargon because I read 20 papers and look up a bunch of definitions and forget that my viewers have not done all of that. I love the science because it answers questions like nothing humans have ever utilized in the past. But the way it gets used to debunk ideas can very often be overzealous, and this is a perfect example. We simply have no data from the appropriate time period to conclusively tell us whether or not metallurgy occurred. But we do have times when it looked like it may have, long ago, during the lowest glacial periods. But this isn't going to look good on Joe Rogan as far as Flint's concerned, and it most certainly would give Hancock too much wiggle room. So if your intention is to debunk him instead of fairly evaluate his claims, you really don't want to mention this. Now, since I've already covered two parts of the debate now, and I haven't said anything really too critical of Hancock, I wanted to point out for the people that are like, this guy never going to say anything about Hancock. Here's a video where I talk about the Bimini Road. Here's a video where I talk about Ganong Padang. Both of those you will find that I am not at all in agreement with Graham Hancock's position. He is not my golden grandpa. I can't really call him a golden child, can I? Even though I'm ancient, he's ancienter. Things just keep getting older.